I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, you will hear stories from Brian Lynn, Dan Friedel, and Gregory Stockel. Then, Jill Robbins brings us a new everyday grammar lesson. But first, Brian Lynn tells us about a new study that took a closer look at the effects of a spacecraft crashing into an asteroid. Scientists say new research confirms results of an earlier study suggesting the crash of a spacecraft into an asteroid changed the shape of the targeted object. The latest research follows another recent study examining the effects of the asteroid strike. NASA crashed its DART spacecraft into the asteroid Dimorphos in 2022 in an area about 11 million kilometers from Earth. The experiment tested a method for changing the orbit of some asteroids to prevent them from possibly crashing into our planet in the future. NASA has said its studies of the crash showed it was successful because the force of the strike changed the asteroid's orbit around a larger asteroid called Didymos. Data also showed the strike reduced the orbital period of Dimorphos by 33 minutes. The team that carried out the most recent research said that in addition to changing the asteroid's orbit, it appears the crash also changed the shape of Dimorphos. This confirms results of the earlier study, which concluded that the crash had likely completely reshaped Dimorphos and turned into a relatively weak collection of rubble. The team carrying out that study used a computer simulation system to study the changes to Dimorphos. The new research suggests that while Dimorphos had a mostly round shape before the crash, it was reshaped by the strike into an object that looks more like a watermelon. The technical term for this kind of shape is triaxial ellipsoid, the scientists said. Steve Chesley is a senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, in California. He was the co-writer of a study describing the findings that recently appeared in the publication Planetary Science Journal. Chesley told Reuters news agency the data studied for the latest research shows Dimorphos is currently a collection of non-solid debris including dust, rocks, and other materials. This state means the asteroid's strength is quite low, permitting Dimorphos to reshape more easily than a more solid object. The new study's lead writer was Shantanu Naidu. He told Reuters the asteroid was able to completely reshape because the strike by the asteroid turned much of its material into rubble. The researchers based their findings on the shape and orbit of Dimorphos on observations from ground-based telescopes. They looked at how sunlight reflections off the surface of the two asteroids changed over time. 
They also used data from radio waves that hit the objects and images the DART spacecraft captured. Researchers have said they expect to learn more about the two asteroids in the future. The European Space Agency's Hera spacecraft plans to launch in October and reach the asteroids by late 2026. ASA says Hera's cameras and instruments will carry out detailed studies of Dimorphos and Didymos. During the operation, the spacecraft will aim to collect the most data yet on such an asteroid system. We are anxiously awaiting the arrival of ASA's Hera spacecraft, when we will be able to compare our modeled shape with that obtained from Hera imagery, Chesley said. He added, we will also learn how much the orbit has changed since we last observed it in 2023. I'm Brian Lynn. Barbara Peraza Garcia is from Venezuela. She lives in a single-room apartment in Seattle, Washington, with her family. The family includes her partner and their two small children. They do not have much space, only 17 square meters, but they are happy for now. It's warm. We can cook for ourselves. We have a private bathroom. It's quiet, she said. We can be here as a family now. Peraza Garcia and her family left Venezuela to escape crime and so she could receive medication for a kidney problem. They can only pay for a small living space, but it is less costly than most small living spaces in American cities. It is $900 per month, but that is about $500 less than traditional small apartments known as studios, which are slightly larger. Most single-room apartments in the United States disappeared after the end of World War II when many people left cities for new suburbs. The Furman Center is part of New York University. It supports research into real property and city policy. It produced research that showed New York City lost 70,000 single-room housing units between the first part of the 1900s and 2014. At the same time, Real estate companies built new city housing, but the developers did not center their work on small living spaces. In recent years, single people needed to find roommates and share two- or three-bedroom apartments in cities if they did not have much money. Now, however, many American cities are worried about increasing living costs and homelessness. The small living spaces, known as single-room occupancy units, once called SROs, are becoming common again. They are being called micro-apartments. New York, Seattle, and Portland, Oregon, are putting money into smaller living spaces, New York's Governor Kathy Hochul announced a $50 million plan to repair and renovate 500 SROs across the state. In Portland, a group called Central City Concern 
supervises about 1,000 SROs and makes them available at a very low cost to people who might otherwise be homeless. They are $550 per month. Cheyenne Wellborn moved into one of the units last year after years of living on the street. The room is only big enough for a small bed, a television, a chair, and a toilet and sink. But it means Wellborn, as he said, can have a nice home, a decent home. When he moved into the apartment, all he had was one bag, and he was glad he did not have to spend another winter outside. I just want a home, you know, he said. The small units are good for single people, but some experts worry that not enough is being done for families. Marisa Zapata is a land use professor at Portland State University. Zapata said she worries that governments and planners will see the SROs as a solution and not do right by our community members by building the housing that people want. But Vicki Bean, a law professor and a director at the Furman Center, said she hopes the work being done in places like Portland and Seattle will help other cities understand there is still a need for simple housing. The alternatives are people being in shelters, people being on the street, people being doubled, tripled, quadrupled up, said Bean. Even if the Perasa garcia family would like more space, Barbara said she is happy. Her kids get to live near their relatives, and they can be close to food stores and green spaces to play in. She said the family will work to save some money and try to get better jobs during the next year. If that works, they can move to a bigger place. We're happy because we're here in a quiet place where we can be together as a family, she said. I'm Dan Friedel. A new study involving stars that formed together shows how lucky Earth is to be in a normal planetary system. Researchers studied 91 pairs of stars that formed together and were similar in size and substance. Their research showed that a surprising number showed signs of having absorbed a planet. The stars likely absorbed a planet after it was pushed out of a stable orbit. This might have been caused by gravitational influences from other planets or even other stars. The stars involved are being called twins because they formed together. The researchers call them conatal stars, and they had equal masses and ages. These twins were moving in the same direction in the Milky Way galaxy, but were not connected by gravity. Researchers chose the twin stars because a star's chemistry likely changes when it absorbs a planet. The planet would introduce amounts of a few elements that are not present in a normal star. The researchers looked for stars that were different from their twin. They also tried to identify elements in the stars 
that would show that a planet had been absorbed. Those elements include iron, nickel, or titanium. In at least seven of the twin stars, one of the two stars showed signs of absorbing a planet. Fan Liu of Monash University in Australia was the lead writer of the research that was released in the publication Nature. Scientist Yuan Sun Ting of the Australian National University and the Ohio State University helped write the study. He commented that the research really shows what a lucky position Earth is in. He said, "The stability of a planetary system like the solar system is not a given." The researchers used the European Space Agency's Gaia Space Observatory to find the twin stars. They also used telescopes in Chile and Hawaii to identify the chemical elements present in the stars. The stars were as close as seventy light years from Earth. And as far as 960 light years away, a light year is the distance light travels in a year, or 9.5 trillion kilometers. The researchers said it is most likely that their observations showed that whole planets had been absorbed, but they added it was possible. They were identifying planetary building blocks being absorbed during a system's period of planet formation. Some stars, like our sun, expand towards the end of their life. During this time, they might absorb nearby planets. Later, the stars collapse, becoming very small, dense stars called white dwarfs. Ting said, "All stars, like the sun, become much larger." Ting said, "Earth will be absorbed by the sun." The stars in the study were not nearing the end of their life. Instability in planetary systems might be more common than once thought. About eight percent of the twin stars studied. Had one star that likely absorbed a planet. Ting said most planetary systems, like our solar system, should be stable. He said the reason is that planets are mostly influenced by their main star, not other planets in their system. Ting added that for other planetary systems. With different beginnings and conditions, this might break down. That might lead to instability. Ting said the study shows that many planetary systems are unstable. That means there are always planets thrown into or out of these systems. Since only a small percentage of these planets are absorbed. There might be more planets than once thought, traveling in exile without a star to orbit. Ting said, "Understanding which planetary systems are stable or not is a long-time goal of planetary dynamics theorists." I'm Gregory Stockel. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com.
has begun in the northern half of the earth. For Christians, a major springtime holiday is Easter. This year, Easter falls on March 31st. In this week's Everyday Grammar, we learn how to talk about holidays and the foods, objects, and activities connected to them. On Easter Sunday, families with children follow the tradition of coloring eggs and hiding them for an egg hunt. Some of the eggs are just one color, but others are painted in great detail. The Easter eggs symbolize new life and rebirth. There is a mythical animal we talk about at Easter, the Easter bunny. Bunnies, or rabbits, stand for fertility in some cultures. That is because rabbits reproduce easily and often. In the days and weeks before Easter, toy bunnies are found in stores. So are plastic eggs that parents fill with candies to give their children on Easter morning. The American president even hosts an Easter egg roll at the White House on the Monday after Easter. The child who rolls their egg the farthest distance without breaking it is the winner. Lamb is often served at Easter meals. For Christians, lamb represents Jesus Christ, who Christians call the Lamb of God. Another food that is common at Easter is ham. Pigs symbolized good luck in Europe in the time before Christianity. You might have noticed three ways we have talked about the connections people make between the foods and symbols of Easter. They involve two transitive verbs and a phrasal verb. First, we used symbolize, which means to be a representation or expression of something. We said that eggs symbolize new life. Next is stands for, a phrasal verb. We said that bunnies stand for fertility. In this case, stands for also means to be a representation of something. Finally, we used represents to explain the importance and meaning of lamb. Let's look a bit more at how to use these words. Symbolize is the verb form of the noun symbol. A symbol is an object, action, or event that expresses a quality or idea. Let's compare the verb and noun form. We will start with an example using symbolize. The lion symbolizes courage. The sentence has this structure, noun phrase plus symbolize plus noun. Now let's look at how to use symbol. The lion is a symbol of courage. The sentence has this structure, noun phrase plus B plus a symbol of plus noun. Please note that even though our two example sentences have different structures, the meaning is the same. Of course, you can create much more complex sentences and examples when using symbolize or symbol. But for this lesson, we will keep things simple. Now let's take a closer look at stand for. This phrasal verb has a few different meanings. But in our description of Easter, we used stand for in the same way we use symbolize. That is right. It means to be a representation or symbol of something. Here is another example. The color yellow often stands for happiness and joy. Finally, we have represent. This verb has many meanings. In this lesson, represent means to serve as a symbol or sign of something. Let's look at this word in another example sentence. Wedding rings represent a married couple's love. Today, we have learned three verbs you can use to describe holiday celebrations. Symbolize, stand for, and represent. Let's quickly compare our three verbs. All of them are transitive verbs, 
meaning they take a direct object. And they can all be used in a simple structure. Noun or noun phrase, plus verb, or a phrasal verb, plus noun or noun phrase. For example, Red symbolizes love. Red stands for love. Red represents love. Try to use all three verbs to tell us about a holiday that you celebrate. What do the foods or activities of the day symbolize, stand for, or represent? You can email us at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Everyday Grammar. I'm Jill Robbins. Robbins joins us now to talk more about that everyday grammar lesson. Thanks for joining us, Jill. Hi, Ashley. So what are you planning to do for Easter? I help with a youth program at our church, and every year we have a big Easter egg hunt. We've been getting ready for it for the past month. What do you do to get ready? We save the plastic eggs we used in the past and give them out to some volunteers at the church. They take them home and refill them with little toys, stickers, or candies. Then, on Easter morning, we hide them all over the yard. Our church has a big green space with lots of good places to hide eggs. And when do the children get to do the hunt? After Sunday school, they meet with their parents who have been in church. We give each one a basket, and they run around the yard looking for eggs. We tell the older kids to leave the easy ones, the eggs that aren't really hidden well, for the little kids. The older kids can find the ones that are up in trees or behind bushes. So the parents are with the little kids. Maybe they can help them find the eggs. Right, and there is one huge golden egg that has a grand prize in it. What's inside that one? I think it's something like a gift card for a bookstore. That sounds like a lot of fun. Do you have any advice for our listeners who might want to try something like this? Yes, I did it in my own yard once, and the kids didn't find all the things I hid. The squirrels did, though. So it's a good idea to check around later to make sure there aren't any eggs left for the wildlife. That's a good point. And good to know. I am sure the little ones will have a lot of fun on Sunday. Thanks again for joining us, and have a happy Easter. Thanks, Ashley. Same to you. Now, here is the question we will answer in tomorrow's Ask a Teacher. Be sure to listen to the program tomorrow to hear the answer from VOA Learning English teacher, Gina Bennett. Dear teacher, I am from Burma. I read the following sentence from a book. In Norway, there's an art museum for children's art. The book mentioned it is a complex sentence. I am wondering if it's right or not. Please tell me. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Your loyal reader, Kya Zin Uyu. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.